And so the goal of our webinar today. Um, so as many of you probably know, over 90% of prairie habitat in uh, the Puget Lowlands has been lost and over 99% in the Willamette Valley um, of, of prairie and savanna habitat. And so with development and agriculture in this region um, growing a lot, it's made uh, protecting conservation lands, of course, a priority and, and saving these broad habitat pieces for our um, for grassland birds. Uh, but there's also a really important push to conserve working lands. Um, that's obviously very important for a variety of reasons. And so this gives us this really worthy challenge of how can we marry the two? How can we protect working lands, protect conservation lands, um, do both? And, and really, these uh, grassland birds are a wonderful nexus for proving that that can happen on the same landscape. Um, so it really helps uh, maximize the few opportunities we have to protect these open landscapes, um, utilize open space, and and fortunately grassland birds really thrive in these landscapes when correctly managed. So today um, Bob Altman and Gary Slater are going to outline kind of the, the current plight of grassland birds, especially focusing on the Oregon Vesper Sparrow. Um, and then uh, a few folks, uh, Derek Salyers and Matt Blakely Smith, are going to talk about what it kind of looks like grazing on the ground and, and their perspectives of it. And then you'll hear from some of our conservation partners about uh, financial and technical uh, support that's available for landowners that engage in conservation. Um, we'll provide Q and A's throughout this, and um, we, this is the first of a two event series. So we'll, um, in May, have a second event uh, to be determined if that's in person, virtual, or some combination of that. Um, and that's where we'll really, that second event, delve into timing, duration, really the implementation side of it. So today we're kind of giving the background, hopefully getting you familiar with this idea, and we'll talk all the details at the next event. Um, so I just want to give a big thank you to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology for funding this workshop and to all the all of you for attending and to um, our kind of panel of folks that are going to be presenting today. Um, so as I said, Gary and Bob um, will get us started and then Derek and Matt will talk about kind of grazing for birds and practice and then we'll hear from Tom Snyder from NRCS, Jared Jabusik from US Fish and Wildlife Service and Laura Tesler from ODFW. Um, so with that, Bob, take it away. Okay, so um, let's let's just start real big picture here. Th this slide shows you some numbers. Um, this information was taken from the, the, the annual State of the Birds report. And as you can clearly see on the left-hand side, the graph there shows grassland birds declining uh, at a much greater rate than any of the other groups of bird species. It looks like, you know, over 50% decline since 1970, which is about when the breeding bird survey started. And that's where this data is taken from. If you want to put it into some numbers on the right, basically we've lost about 720 million grassland birds since 1970. Uh, next slide, Elspeth. So what, what happened? Well, um, that what I just talked about was the last 50 years or so, so that's pretty recent. But of course, we know that grasslands, uh, from a term from the perspective of habitat loss, there was large losses throughout the beginning of this, the Euro-American Euro settlement of the country. Um, but this will give you a little bit of zoomed in perspective just on the Willamette Valley itself from basically around 1850 to now. And as you can see, virtually all of the native grassland has been lost. Um, so um, this has been a common feature throughout the continent, but certainly from our part of the world, we've seen the, uh, we've seen drastic declines in the habitat that these birds used. Next, and that you know, that loss took on a lot of different forms. If you look in the upper left, it, there was, of course, significant permanent habit lo habitat loss, just the development. Uh, upper right, there was a lot of conversion of that grassland habitat into agriculture, some of which, like in the upper right, really provide next to no value to grassland birds. If you go lower left uh, to vineyards, 
uh, another type of agriculture. It provided some habitat for some birds, depending upon the species. And then if you go lower right, pasture lands, which can provide uh, significantly uh, good habitat for some species. And that'll be our focus today. Go ahead. I always want to bring this, this up because um, we always have to recognize that habitat's not always the bottom line here when we're talking about declining bird populations. Um, there are a lot of other issues out there that affect them, a lot of threats. You know, we could go through a long laundry list of those threats, but it's just important. We're not going to be able to get into that today. We're focused on the habitat end of things, but just keep these this in mind. And in particular, we're seeing more and more evidence of you know, what's referred to as the small population para paradigm, where these birds are um, declining at such a rate that we're, we're finding that there are a lot of small populations that just don't have the resiliency to, to overcome sort of natural fluctuations in their populations. But this is something maybe we can get into in, in when we have the next um, meeting, but we really won't have time for it today. Next. Okay, what birds are we talking about? I, I've got seven up here, seven species of land birds that I would call sort of obligate or, or near obligate to grasslands. I mean, you could add in some short, couple shorebird species, you could add in some waterfowl species. But from our perspective today, talking about pasture lands, I, I'd go with these seven. And, and if you go upper left, grasshopper, sparrow, uh, upper top, streaked horn lark, upper right, Vesper, Oregon Vesper Sparrow, lower right uh, northern harrier, then savanna sparrow, then western meadowlark, and then lower left short-eared owl. So those are the ones that I'm really sort of focused on in terms of this discussion today. Next. And we prioritize these guys differently, as you all know. Um, among these seven, you know, two of them are certainly the highest priority. They have either endangered or threatened status at either the federal or a state level. So there's regulatory considerations regarding streaked horn lark and Oregon Vesper Sparrow. Most of the species have some level of um, status in the state wildlife action plans um, as a sensitive species or a species of greatest conservation need. This level is real, really more of a recommendation for conservation level, it doesn't have the regulatory implications that we see with the um, streaked horn lark and Oregon Vesper Sparrow. And then there are a couple of species that really have no particular status. So they're not all equal in terms of how we um, address them in, in our conservation actions. Next. So when, when people always say something about to me, this is good for grassland birds, and sort of my first question is always, well, which species? Um, because even though we tend to think of grasslands as being a fairly simple ecosystem, and you know, relatively speaking, it is simple if you're comparing it to a forest or a shrubland or something like that. Um, but even within that, that ecosystem, there is a lot of different variability in terms of how the birds utilize the land and the, and, and the conditions that they prefer. So I've got about five slides here that I'm gonna jump through pretty quickly, just to show you this gradient of conditions that might occur in a grassland and how the birds sort of sort themselves out across that gradient. And this is real coarse. There's no numbers here. I'm not getting into that level of detail. It's a fairly coarse presentation, but um, I think it'll help you get the picture here. So let's start with you know, there are dry upland prairies or grasslands and there are wet prairies or wet grasslands. The seven species I'm talking about, they sort of sort themselves out uh, a little bit. You know, they, they prefer one or the other, but most of them will uh, uh, occur to some degree in the other type. But the one different one here is Oregon Vesper Sparrow. It's really, it really is a dry upland grassland bird. It, it does not like to get its feet wet. So we don't find it too often down in wet grasslands. Next. The, of course, these are grassland birds. So you'd say to yourself, well, why is he talking about trees and shrubs? And for the most part, if you can see, these birds do prefer, prefer pure grasslands. But um, several of them, to some degree, like some degree of scattered trees and shrubs. 
And again, the one that jumps out at you is Oregon Vesper Sparrow, which, you know, really likes, you know, scattered trees or shrubs in sort of that five to 15 percent range, uh, which is really uh, different from most of the other of the seven birds, which really are uh, have preferences for pure grasslands. Next. This the next two the next two categories or habitat features are things that actually uh, can be managed for by through grazing and, and other means too, but certainly through grazing. And the first one is grass height. Most of these guys, as you can see, um, are tolerant of a pretty wide range of grass heights, and especially on the taller end. The two that aren't that really want uh, more short statured grass grasses and and forbs are you know the two high priority birds streaked horn lark and oregon vesper sparrow especially streaked horn lark which is not our focus today but again oregon vesper sparrow jumps out as preferring you know relatively shorter statured um, grass heights next this is something that most people don't think about when you think about grassland birds but there is a, a fairly strong need for a certain amount of bare or sparsely vegetated ground in those grasslands for a lot of these species. Now, some of them, like the bigger birds, like the harrier and the short-eared owl, not so much because they're not, you know, obviously they're not as focused in at the ground level so much. But the others really do like, um, sort of from a native perspective, where there was a lot of bunch grasses out there in the native landscape, you'd have these interstitial spaces between the bunches where it would be mostly bare or sparsely vegetated. And the birds use those for movement and they forage in those areas um, where they can find insects or fallen seeds. And of course, streaked horn lark is sort of out in its own world uh, in this category in terms of the amount of bare or sparsely vegetated ground it likes. But again, Vesper Sparrow is right out in there in that sort of five to 15% range of, of this habitat feature. Next, patch size is a big deal for a lot of these birds. In fact, it, it, for a lot of them, it's a limiting factor. Um, when you think about the, the larger birds, obviously the harrier and the owl, they, they need large, you know, in, in acres in the hundreds to really have any kind of population. Street torn lark is also uh, similar to that. And most of them, even grasshopper sparrow, requires some fairly large patches. But Oregon Vesper Sparrow is a little bit unique here in that it actually will occur down in that sort of 20 to 50 acre range. Um, now you wouldn't have much of a population, but you can get some occurrence there, which you know you can you can build off of um, if you do have smaller patches of grassland. Next. This may be the most important question because since we've lost all these native grasslands, it, it's important to know how how well each of these species has adapted to what is out on the landscape now. Um, and so I just tried to break this up. This is a real simple comparison of cropland versus pasture. Now there's all kinds of croplands. There's, you know, I couldn't get into that kind of level of detail here, but just in general, um, most of the species have crossed between the two and they have some degree of utilization of both. Um, but Oregon Vesper Sparrow, again, here sort of is unique in that it is really uh, almost never found in cropland, at least not the typical cropland you think of. Um, the one exception is Christmas tree farms, but other than that, it's not found in most of the croplands that we um, typically think of. And it really is more of a pasture bird. It's the dominant bird out in, in past, grazed pasture lands as far as grassland birds go. Um, next. Okay, that's all. I'm going to hand it off to Gary. Um, th this is our topic, obviously, today, Oregon Vesper Sparrow and Gray's Pasturelands. The one thing I will say before, we, before I hand it off is that, of course, keep in mind, most of these lands are private lands. Um, we will have an example later where Matt will talk about grazing on conservation lands. But from the perspective of Oregon Vesper Sparrow, it really is, at this point in time, it's pretty essential for this bird because we don't have the alternatives for it out there, um, which is something we can get into as we move along today and in our next um, next uh, webinar or hopefully field, field visit. So I'll let Gary take over now.
Thanks, Bob. Uh, next slide. So, so yeah, Bob's given the backdrop on the vulnerable state of grassland habitat and birds, and I'm going to provide a sort of a brief description about Oregon Vesper Sparrows, a little Vesper Sparrow 101, if you will. And the idea is that this information can help those who may not be as familiar with this bird so that we can have this more in-depth discussion. Uh, you know, the first thing I want to note is that this Oregon Vesper Sparrow is a subspecies of the wider ranging Vesper Sparrow, which can be found throughout most of North America. And the differences are really based on shading or of the plumage or variation size. And for a, for a lot of people, you know, this is a pretty nondescript little brown bird um, that is hard to identify from all the other ones. But if you look closely, you can see a couple of characteristics such as a rufous uh, uh, shoulder patch, a white eye ring, and they have some white outer tail feathers when they fly that are pretty easy to, to see. Um, so sort of as you learn more about birds, this one does become easier to identify. Uh, next slide. So, you know, the big thing to to see here is that, and what Bob has already talked about, the Vesper Sparrow has been through some pretty significant population declines and extensive range contraction on its breeding grounds for all the reasons Bob talked about, habitat loss, habitat degradation. Um, the figure on the right uh, shows the historic and current range. The historic range of the Vesper, Oregon Vesper Sparrow is on the left. The current is on the right. Um, the big thing, one of the big things to, to see from this is that that contraction has been significant and that they are nearly extirpated in Washington state. In fact, we think there's probably only two populations that uh, have more than a handful of birds. Overall, uh, the range wide population number estimates about 3000 and this is from an analysis that Bob Bob has done. Um, with the largest remaining regional populations in the Umpqua, which has about 1500 birds and the Lama Valley, which has about 1000 birds. And in both of those areas, the majority of the birds are on private land. And in the Lama Valley, it's notable that most of those birds are on pasture lands. As Bob noted, this is um, the Vesper Sparrow's conservation status is um, it's being currently currently being considered for listing by under the Endangered Species Act by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, big news last week is that Washington State voted to list it as endangered, so that won't officially happen for another week. Um, but it has that status in Washington State and in Oregon, it's considered sensitive critical. So uh, certainly of, of high conservation status in uh, throughout its range. Next slide. So moving just to some general biology, this is a, it's a short distance migrant during the non breeding season. We find it in the Central Valley of California. And unfortunately, we don't know a lot about the migratory movements or its winter habitat use. But as you can guess, the Central Valley of California is a place where it could be uh, exposed to a whole number of, of threats. When we think about this, di the diet of Vesper sparrows, we do think about them as being flexible and opportunistic. They eat grass and forb seeds year round, but they do need, um, they do use a wide variety of insects, especially for their young during the breeding season. In terms of nest placement, like a lot of grassland birds, they nest on the ground. And of course this um, can have implications for, for management because obviously you wanna be careful about minimizing impacts to the nest. Most of their nests are placed next to a, a clump of vegetation or a tree or even a clot of dirt. Uh, they nest usually from late May or I'm sorry, late April to end of July. They're typically producing four eggs uh, in each nest, but they can nest up to two or three times each breeding season. Uh, next slide. So the, the two last things I'm going to talk about are, are habitat and how to manage that habitat. And, and Bob went over some of this stuff, so I'll, I'll go through it pretty quickly. But when we think about Vesper Sparrows at that site, site scale, they're really looking for grassland areas that have to be at least 20 acres. But 20 acres in the middle of a forest isn't going to be very helpful when you're thinking about a population. You need this 
sort of grassland context of in connectivity over about 100 acres. The other thing that they really look they really select for is a very structurally diverse vegetation and that's among all the layers the tree layer and the shrub layer which is what um, that's not really common for a lot of grassland birds but vesper sparrows really use trees and shrubs for uh, singing perches and then in the herbaceous and ground layer they also want that structural diversity um, so at so yes, tree cover, shrub cover, anywhere from you know five to fifteen percent, and scattered and patchy. At the ground level, you know they're looking for an average vegetation height of six to eighteen inches. But what they really need is some of that habitat to be short, so less than six inches, and some of it tall, less than eighteen inches, and then dispersed within that, they also need that bare ground, um, which as Bob noted, they use for sort of moving around um, their nest or usually in areas next to bare ground patches. Yeah, and that's where they forage. So one word I, we've started using up here is that this is kind of like messy habitat. And so creating and managing all this structural diversity is, is sort of one of the challenges and one of the reasons why grazing can be an economic uh, and conservation win. So this slide shows just some of the habitats throughout its range. So the north three um, panels are places in the Lamb Valley. Um, I think the left is a like a prairie oak, kind of a wet area. You know, there's a grazed habitat there, some Christmas tree farms. The two sites to the south are restored prairies in um, South Puget Sound. And you can see some of the big bear patches that uh, the birds will use. Uh, next slide. And then I'm just going to wrap up by touching on management, thinking about how you create these messy conditions. So historically, these conditions would have been created through fire applied by Native Americans, obviously ungulates, uh, herds of deer and elk would have would have come down and grazed, created bear patches. One thing I always like to throw out, at least in South Puget Sound, is gophers create a lot of bare ground, and that may have been an important process for that to happen. And some of those, um, so those, those are the historic context. Today, we, have a, we still have a pretty good toolbox for some of that. We can use prescribed fire. Uh, we can use mowing, especially if we want to create some patches that don't get mowed. But the one habitat that or the one strategy that works really well and the one that we're going to talk about. Next slide. Is grazing. And when grazing is conducted at the right time, at the right intensity, it can produce sort of that win-win combination for landowners and conservation. And with that, that's the end of Vesper Sparrow 101. Perfect. So before we move on to the the grazing and the kind of what you're probably all waiting for, I just want to give a chance if anyone had any bird specific questions for, for Gary and Bob. Of course, we'll get into the, the grazing side next. Uh, you can just unmute yourself or raise your hand and then unmute yourself if you have questions. I have a couple of questions. I am curious Great. about do can you tell me first of all how many eggs do they lay do they lay a couple of times like you know how some like streetcar and lyrics will lay a couple of eggs a couple of times like they'll clutch a different a couple of different times um and what do you think the success is like if they lay three eggs do only one of them make it or can you just comment on how that works for vesper sparrow Uh, Bob, you're on mute, but I, I can answer that, um, I guess. Um, so they lay, you know, anywhere from three to five eggs each nest. Um, I think we've seen variable hatch rates. Um, so there's multiple stages of survival. So in terms of the number of eggs that hatch, we're seeing anywhere from um, 60 to 80 percent, which is a little bit lower than some grassland birds, which are hatching at over 90 percent. 
So in terms of the number of birds that are fledging, again, I think it's pretty variable. I would say nest success, the likelihood of a nest producing at least one young is around 20 to 40 percent, and that probably varies a little bit depending upon habitat um, and the conditions at the time. Bob, do you have anything else to add to that? And if you do, you have to unmute yeah, yourself. Unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. Still muted. I don't know how to unmute you, Bob. <laughs> there we go. All right. Yep. Yep. So, it, yeah, Laura, if, if, if you nest on the ground, a lot of things can go wrong. <laughs> and a lot of things <laughs> do go wrong, just naturally. Um, Gary said, you know, if you really got down to it, well less than half of the nests um, uh, are successful. I mean, you know, somewhere in that 20 to 40, 30 to 40, whatever range, that's your success rate. But of course, they make up for it to some degree by being able to do multiple uh, attempts during the course of the year. That's the, the their counter to that. Um, but success rate is typically low for a ground any ground nesting bird and uh, certainly ground nesting grassland birds. Great. There is a question from John. Do you want to unmute yourself? Okay, maybe while John figures that out, Kathleen, do you want to ask your question? Oh, go ahead. Come back to me. Thank you. Okay. Hey guys, uh, Kathleen here. Um, what is the regular st regulatory status of Oregon Vesper Sparrow in BC right now? Endangered. Extra and they bit. have, um, so they have plans in place. I don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's completely gone from British Columbia. Um, so there's no, you know, they're, they're endangered, but there aren't any birds. So, um, you know, and there's no plans to move birds. Obviously we're sort of worried about keeping birds even in Washington at this point. Okay. Thanks. Okay. John, did you want to ask your question? Sure. Thanks. Can you all hear me this time? Right on, thank you. Uh, Gary, it was hard to tell from, uh, well, first, thank you. Lots of really cool information from both you, uh, Gary and Bob. Uh, it's hard to tell from your range map, uh, but are there any known populations of the Oregon Vesper Sparrow in the Portland metro area? Uh, I'll try, I'll take an attempt at that. Um, I don't know the boundaries of Metro, but if you go up the river, up and down the river a bit, um, and actually Gary could probably talk about uh, islands in the Columbia River um, in that general area, certainly not in Metro. I, I don't know, you know, there's an occasional bird that occurs on some of the Metro properties and, and you know, Elaine and Katie have talked about that, but as far as a population, I don't think I, I can recall of any. In, within Metro itself. I mean, there are around around Portland, outside of Portland and around that area, there certainly are some. Yeah. Historically, they were on some of the deposition islands in the Columbia River um, back in the early 2000s. I, I would say over the last five years, most of those islands have been surveyed and monitored and they're, they have not yielded any detections of Vesper Sparrows. There are a couple that have not been revisited in, in many years, but that would also make me suspect that they might have disappeared because deposition is probably what was keeping those areas more grassland. And if they haven't been deposited since 2005, they're most likely wooded by now um, and are unlikely to be there. Yeah, one thing just to just to sort of add to that, it's, it's important to keep in mind that um, this is a migratory bird, so you will get sightings in different places, and certainly there are annually some sightings right around Portland and perhaps even on metro properties. 
But a sighting, you know, during migration is certainly a lot different than having a population. And, and that's, that's the challenge we have is, you know, uh, main, uh, developing and maintaining populations at sites. And so uh, from a metro perspective, I guess I'm not familiar with any populations. There's a few more hands up and then a few questions in the chat. Um, so one is, uh, how do the Oregon Vesper Sparrow and the other grassland species respond to solar panel fields? Solar panel fields? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess in terms of the footprint of the panels negatively, I mean, there's obviously not going to be anything, any birds associated with the actual footprint of the panels. I guess if you're speaking a little bit wider, maybe the footprint of um, the, the particular land ownership that they're on. Um, again, I don't, I don't think that the, the, fa the fact that there's a development there, whatever that development is, solar panels or whatever, that rules that out as habitat. Then the question becomes, is there sufficient grassland around that of some large quantity that could support a population? And so it would depend upon what's nearby and how big it is and what kind of conditions it is. It, uh, you know, what type of habitat conditions are there? But the, I mean, the solar array itself, obviously they're not there. And then there's another question in the chat that um, I think you can touch on briefly, but we'll get into more in the next um, the next webinar, which is, is there guidance for timing grazing with the nesting season concerns about trampling? Um, I know, Bob, we've talked about that a lot. Do you want to just touch on that briefly? Yeah, because that's always a big question. And um, it's, it's always, I've all, always wondered that too, but we've got some really, um, substantial data on this now. So I've been working on three properties where um, grazing is occurring, lar fairly large properties and fairly large scale grazing for the last five years. Um, our rate of nest trampling by cattle is 5.4%. Um, that to be more specific, over the last four years, that's been five nests. So five nests in four years have been trampled by cattle. Um, so, and that's a fairly large sample size. That's almost a hundred nests across that area. So that that's, I mean, that's the rate. And so the question always comes up, is that too much, too little? Uh, the flip side of that is without the cattle grazing those lands, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, they would not be suitable for the bird. So it's a balancing act and it's a trade-off that you're looking at here in terms of, there is some level of acceptable loss of nest if indeed um, without the grazing element, there would not be habitat at all for all of the other birds that are, that managed to successfully produce young. So. Um, 5.4 percent with a pretty good sample size. Thanks, Bob. Um, and then F Sharp, I don't know your name, but uh, did you have a question? Yeah, hi, Fred here. Is this Vesper Sparrow at all amenable to um, foster parenting techniques where, say, like in bluebirds, where eggs get moved from um, one species to another to be um, raised by fosters? Over. Gary, you go that one. That's right up your alley. Yeah, um, we don't we don't have any information on that. Um, it's never been it's never been tried. Um, I, you know that that would be a whole a whole another discussion about what would be the best reintroduction if if, if we were to go down a, a road of reintroduction. What would be the best strategies? And uh, you know, I think cross fostering would probably be on the low on the the low end of the priority list compared to other reintroduction methods. Roger that, thank you. Great, so I think we're gonna move on. We'll have more opportunities for questions later that come up. I'm glad to see so much interest so far. Um, 
So we're going to dive into kind of what does this look like on the ground? Um, so we're going to talk about two properties as we um, highlighted before. One's a working ranch that now is in conservation status um, that is, you know, actively grazed and, and is protected partially to protect these, these birds. The other one is a conservation property that has these birds and a grazing has been brought on or maintained um, as a management tool. So we're going to kind of come at it from both perspectives. Um, so I just want to start um, by highlighting the first one, which is Cresswell Oaks, which if we have the second event <laughs> in person, this is where the, the, uh, what the event will be. We'll see how that shakes out. Um, so Cresswell Oaks is a 1,600-acre working ranch just, just south of Eugene. Um, it's grassland is actively grazed, it's um, conifer forest is sustainably harvested, and the kind of oak woodlands are being um, enhanced um, and at an increasing rate since conservation has been involved. Um, in considering this property for protection, Bob got out there uh, with, with kind of historical knowledge of Vesper Sparrow occurring on this property and did confirm that it has this really healthy um, lar largest known population in the valley of Oregon Vesper Sparrow. And so that, of course, made it a really even bigger priority to protect this property um, with funding from Bonneville Power through the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program uh, that we were able to, the Center for Natural Lands Management was able to place a conservation easement on the property, which removes development rights, protects it, and allows it to continue being a working um, property as multiple generations that live on it and manage the land. Um, I think Crystal Oaks is just a really prime example of how working lands can be hugely valuable to, to bird conservation by maintaining suitable habitat through those very management um, actions being done as a working land, um, while maintaining, you know, the the financial aspect of it for the landowner. And, and in this case, it was economically sound grazing could continue. Um, so on the on the left here is a, a cover type of Cresswell Oaks and with the grazed grassland and, and kind of the beige, which you can see uh, arrows too. Um, and then on the right, you'll see a map of the, the little white circles are where Oregon Vesper Sparrow occurs. And, you know, if you looked at just the map on the right um, from kind of a traditional standpoint, you think, OK, that's where no one goes there, you know, during the nesting season. That's the no go zone. But clearly, if you look, that, that's the overlap. Where grazing occurs is where the Vesper Sparrow occurs. And we've already talked about this a lot, but it's it's no uh, coincidence that that's happening. The bird is persisting where grazing has occurred and has persisted for some time because of that management um, tool, because of the conditions that grazing creates. It creates the suitable habitat. And now with conservation partners involved, little monitoring can happen, little tweaks can happen to, to make sure it maintains that suitable status. But um, really what was happening on that property was already good for it. And so now we can just kind of continue in that lens, making it, um, making sure it just stays positive and, and it tweaking as we learn more. Um, it's really reasonable that landowners can be skeptical about getting involved with conservation. Um, and, and some ecologists we understand are hesitant about accepting grazing and forestry and other working lands things in a conservation landscape, worried that that will negatively impact um, the bird. But I think the Cresswell Oaks is just one of these wonderful scenarios that shows that if it's managed correctly, if everyone is really communicating clearly and on the same page, you know, grassland birds can be conserved on active, actively worked, actively grazed lands, um, which allows them to maintain their working status, be part of the local economy, um, keep families on the land that they love, um, while also providing much needed habitat for imperiled birds. And in doing so, these landowners not only get to stay on the land, but now they're, you know, they are brought into this conservation world and have technical and financial assistance um, available to them. And that can create even more opportunities, um, both for the landowner to improve their land, and then obviously not just for the maybe target species, but big impacts for conservation. Um, so with thoughtful implementation, it can be a really winning scenario for all partners. Um, now, Derek was going to talk, but Derek is MIA. Uh, he was in transit this morning and I haven't heard from him this morning. And uh, 
I think their Levanche might have gotten some ice and I think they might be dealing with some stuff there. So I'm going to try to get a hold of him by the end, but um, I just, I think we're going to, I'm going to let Matt talk. We'll come, we'll try to come back to Derek um, and certainly everyone on this call that's presenting uh, has worked out at Derek's property and has seen it. And so I think can, can speak to it a little as well if they like, but I think um, what I really want to highlight um, and hopefully Derek will be able to get on and talk. And if not, this second uh, workshop is focused specifically on Derek kind of talking about implementation and, and what it's like on the on the ground. But, you know, working with Derek has been really wonderful. His family, you know, they were so excited to learn that they could keep doing what they love on their land and help this bird. They've been super excited. They're so always happy when Bob or or our our folks from Eco Studies come down and, and talk with them and get them out seeing vesper sparrows and other rare species and really have been open to kind of what monitoring do we do, what tweaks can we make, what what adjustments can we make to keep doing this ranching and really help these birds. And so it's been a really um, just a really positive experience. So with that. I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Well, hi everybody. I'm Matt Blakely Smith from Greenbelt Land Trust. And here's a picture of Bob, my field assistant. Uh, jokingly said, Bob has been a great mentor for me uh, over the last few years. And it's been this great collaboration of um, I'm a botanist and he's the wildlife biologist and together we've uh, created hundreds of acres of habitat uh, for Vesper sparrows. Um, so this is a picture of um, Bob's torture device, um, vegetation torture device, and I'll explain about that a little bit later. Um, what you're looking at here is a picture of Bald Hill Farm. It's a 600 acre conservation property just outside of Corvallis and it was purchased with a combination of um, OWEB money, the Bonneville's WWMP um, grant funding, Section 6 from Fish and Wildlife, a lot of community donations, um, as well as the landowner. He gave us a bargain sale. Um, he was really committed to conserving this property in his family. Um, so um, before we purchased this property in about uh, 2013, it was heavily grazed. And again, thinking of the Willamette Valley, um, practically, it's all practically private and um, open space. If there's no houses on it, open space is farmed. And so uh, what does that look like? Really productive ground goes into um, row crops or specialty crops and kind of marginal land go, is grazed. And often on these poor soils, um, that's about the only way you can make money is by grazing. And so when we took on this property, it had been overgrazed for decades. And really the only native prairie that we had was along fence rows and inaccessible corners. Um, but at the same time, we had one of the most, uh, one of the largest populations of Vesper sparrows in the valley. And so something was working right. And, but when we took ownership, we instinctively wanted to reduce grazing. There's this kind of community bias the cattle have destroyed the West. So uh, maybe we need to reduce the grazing out there. But uh, we really quickly realized um, that and Bob was influential in this and recognizing that there's this tight correlation between those grazed areas and Vesper Sparrow has that. In places where we did um, decide to stop grazing, um, maybe it was too wet, we didn't want the cows to trample the soil, um, the Vesper sparrows immediately abandoned those areas. And so we saw a reduction in the population at Bald Hill Farm. So we really started to take a closer look at how we manage those prairies with cattle grazing. Um, and for about five years, we tracked every single nest on the property. And uh, thanks a lot to Lisa Milbank and Joel Geyer, who literally combed the grassland looking for these nests because they're highly cryptic. Um, and then once we found those nests, Bob and I would set up these vegetation sampling plots. And that's how we describe, um, we get a better idea of what are these birds selecting for? What does that habitat look like? 
And we've already talked about that, but you can see it's really short snatched vegetation that is incredibly important. Again, these are um, poor soils that aren't very productive, so things don't grow very big. There's a lot of annual grasses, a lot of um, weedy species, but they also do need some vertical structure, some of those larger clumping grasses. We saw um, lolium was an introduced species, but that's where they like to kind of tuck their nest under. And so we're able to describe that habitat. We took a lot of data on those nest plots. And now when we create new habitat, we're um, withdrawing some of these fields from grazing and we're um, planting new native prairie. And now we can um, use that data to um, design our restorations so that they meet those habitat needs for uh, Vesper sparrows. So specifically shorter statured, higher diversity of forbs, um, and trying to really reduce a lot of the taller grasses. Um, so, um, you know, for the first year or two on restoration sites, you actually have um, the Vesper sparrows love it because the um, vegetation hasn't grown up so quickly. Um, but after about year two, it's too tall and they start abandoning it again. And so we need to figure out um, what is that disturbance mechanism? Most of us would probably love to burn these areas, but the reality is um, burning just is um, not going to happen on the huge landscape level that we needed to happen to um, rescue some of these birds. So we look to kind of ecological theory, thinking about uh, your ecology class, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis says that diversity is highest at that middle point of disturbance. If it's disturbed constantly, um, then plants and animals can't establish. If it's not disturbed enough, it just turns into a brush field uh, and eventually a forest. So how do we meet that intermediate level, um, that, that sweet spot? And uh, next slide, please, Elspeth. We found that cattle grazing um, has been incredibly helpful in hitting that sweet spot. Um, we, um, we've played around a lot with um, figuring out exactly the timing um, of that grazing. A lot of times for Vesper sparrows, uh, what we'd like to start doing is hit it pretty hard in April before um, the plant, before the birds show up on habitat. And so the cows have been able to run through and um, beat down some of the grass. Maybe their hoof prints make some, um, some muddy areas that the birds actually key into. Um, so from a kind of an armchair perspective, it's really um, pretty straightforward. You're trying to match your grass growth with your uh, cattle consumption rate. But... Uh, a producer might want to maximize that rate, but from an ecological perspective, maybe we're not stocking the cattle at the highest density. Maybe we want to, we want to reduce the herd numbers. Um, if we're, we probably want to rotate the cattle between different pastures that have been fenced off so that they're just not out on pasture for six months, we might, we'll probably try to move them between um, different fields throughout the season. Um, we're always providing rest periods so that, again, um, you have the staggered um, growth throughout your entire property where you've got areas of short veg, areas of tall veg, um, of grass length. Um, so from an ecological perspective as well, we, we don't always want to do the same thing every single year in the same field. So thinking about how do we create um, how do we create that heterogeneous kind of landscape? And from a farming perspective, they might not necessarily like that. Um, it would probably be better to have more predictability and what those rotations are. But from an ecological standpoint, um, if you do the same thing on the same site every single year, you end up, that's a selective pressure. And so you end up, um, getting more uniform species as well as um, structure. So we wanna mix it all up. So um, the devil is really in the details though. It sounds pretty easy. 
Um, what we're really concerned about though is that restored habitat for native prairie grasses, the forage quality really is kind of low and it's not that attractive to producers uh, to set their cattle out there. Um, on top of that, everybody wants their pastures grazed in April. That's if uh, a producer has to pick, they're probably not going to graze your roamers fescue when they can get tall fescue that's been fertilized um, and manicured. So how do you actually attract a grazer to your property is a real challenge that we face with when there's an abundance of forage. Um, everybody has the same window of grazing. Um, so that relationship really needs to be, um, it's a special relationship. Uh, you really need to nurture it um, and you need to convince somebody to come onto your property. Um, but that means there needs to be some give and take. Uh, an ecologist is not going to be able to just set all these parameters um, and make it really difficult for a grazer because they won't show up. They'll have other better options. So we need some um, concessions and recognize that from an ecological perspective, things might happen that we don't like. There might be a bunch of muddy spots in your field. Uh, your wildflowers might get nibbled down. Um, maybe even a nest, a bird nest might get smashed. Um, again, what Bob said, it's actually incredibly unlikely that nests are trampled by cattle. Um, but you need to recognize, again, the bigger perspective on what are the gains we're getting? Ecologically, um, grazing has been beneficial when done uh, properly. And so um, it, it gets a bit messy and we need to recognize that the producers really um, have needs as well. They have economic needs um, and they need to make a profit and their cattle um, have a way of um, messing things up if you're a purist and a, a, taking an ecological view. Um, but we need to um, balance that back and forth. So it's that, um, that intersection of um, ecological and economic needs and then having a good interpersonal relationship with your rancher um, and understanding that there needs to be a lot of give and take. So. Um, I went over my time since um, since Derek was not here. Maybe that's okay that I spoke for a little bit longer, but uh, that's all I have for now. And happy to take some questions or have a group discussion because there's a lot of people here with a, a lot of information as well. Perfect. And Derek is joining as we speak. Okay. So I'm going to stall a little to let him get settled, but I think Derek has joined us. Um, just before Derek... Uh, dives in. Um, I just want to talk a little bit. Uh, I was going to do this at the end, but um, just, mon you know, as you've heard from all this, data is important. Monitoring is important. If you're going to have any sort of management tool in the landscape, including grazing, you need to know how that's impacting your, your population. Um, and so just that feedback loop is really critical. And uh, this webinar is funded by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and they Ask that we kindly talk about eBird, which is a really great tool. And so we just want to click to that slide. If you're not familiar with eBird, it is a great, great way to um, have your not only enter data and a place to put your data, but also a great just resource for information about kind of what birds are occurring in your area. Um, so it's, you know, it's free. You can enter it online and then um, you can do it on your app. And importantly, um, there's just a lot of great data on there um, to look at distribution and we'll send out information about this um, uh, after the webinar. With that, um, I see that Michelle Tierhe has a question. I'll have you ask your question, Michelle, and then I'll see if Derek's ready to present. Okay, thanks for that. Um, hopefully you can hear me, Matt. Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, Matt, I was um, I was curious as somebody who doesn't, um, uh, I'm a wildlife biologist of the state and I'm recently starting to use grazing more and more here for grassland um, 
uh, bird management as well, some other uh, listed species management. Um, but I don't have a lot of time to invest in 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 being the one to organize the grazing. And um, I, I've recently been given a name and started um, coordinating with a, a sort of, I want to call him an ecological grazer, someone who grazes locally and, and does this sort of ecologically frame of mind that others have used. But I'm curious if you um, or maybe you and our Washington partners have thought about uh, putting together a list or if there is a list of people that – um, are doing this kind of work, grazing livestock um, on private properties for ecological purposes um, that others of us could go to. Um, as you say, there, these some of these grazers are in short supply, um, but a listing of these people that have these specialty with using livestock for these purposes so others of us that uh, don't have that time can maybe pull off some of those lists and be more comfortable that these people – uh, you know, sort of know what we're going to be asking of them. Yeah, this is really interesting. Grazing, one of the challenges is grazing is hyper-local. Um, it's a very low margin uh, from a profit perspective business. I'm not like, there are very brave people who graze because I don't think they make a lot of money very often. Um, and so one of the major um, expenses they have is moving cattle. So just trucking cattle from field to field is incredibly expensive. And when you consider how much you're making um, as a lesser when we lease our fields, it's um, we're not making much money. And when you consider how much of our time as an organization we um, spend on monitoring, on coordinating on contracting, we're probably losing money. Um, and so it probably uh, would be helpful for folks um, to um, coordinate more on their grazing. The, the fact of the matter is, at least in the Valley, there's precious few people um, that are really um, doing this, especially on, a, on an ecological fashion. So um, there's a lot of potential and um, for it to be very hyper local and essentially having your neighbor graze your property because it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have folks want to move their cattle very far very often hey michelle this is gary i can jump in real quick um and just say that that this is an interesting that is an interesting issue that is getting some consideration here in south puget sound and uh, just to let you know that um Sarah Hammond has a proposal to do exactly what you're talking about through the uh, Recreation Conservation Office at, in, um, in Washington, and that is to match uh, farmers who are looking for grazing opportunities with landowners who have grazed property that they are not grazing and combining those together, and especially doing it with, um, you know, thinking about veteran veterans in this area that sort of own a lot of the pasture land. So uh, that's something just to keep an eye on in the next six months or so. We're hoping to hear back um, a final decision on that, but that is just the question you're asking about how to, you know, getting names of people who have cows and getting names of people who want grazing is, uh, seems like that's on the forefront of where we're going. That's great. Thanks for that. I'll keep an eye out for that, Gary. Appreciate it. And Janelle from Friends of Beaver Park um, also added that a small farms program through OSU can probably provide a list. And also, it never hurts to check with your local soil and water conservation district. Good tips there. Um, John, did you have a question? Yeah, totally. Hey, uh, thank you, Matt. Great stuff. Uh, cool to see. I really, really enjoy the talks here. Do you have any experience using animals other than cows for grazing? Uh, we have used sheep. Um, we've used um, primarily cattle. Sheep, there are, I mean, generally people say that sheep will eat your wildflowers before they'll eat your grass. And our biggest issue is um, grass growth and consumption, um, and sheep are kind of harder to fence in, even though you can use electric fencing, they tend to be insulated and be, kind of escape more. So 
I'm sure there's people on this list. I'd love to hear from folks besides me that might have experience um, with other types of livestock. Okay, I'm gonna give Derek a chance to talk for a bit, and then I think we'll we'll come back to questions after that. Um, let me just get over to his slide. Okay, Derek, are you able to unmute yourself and chat? I uh, let's see. Hi, does anybody does anybody hear me? We all hear you. Thank you for joining us. I, I have I, I have to tell you all. I am in a very northern, northern part of Nevada on a satellite dish, and it was a challenge for an old rancher to figure this out, but I'm glad to be here. And forgive me, I haven't heard everything that's been set up to this point, I heard the last couple of questions, which was great. So forgive me in, in advance if I repeat something or create controversy with my response. So that's it's good to be there. with you. And I, I, we're so glad you could join us. And I kind of gave the background of, of the your property and um, the population on it. And I think just having you talk a little bit about what it's been like to get involved with conservation and how it's kind of, you know, not the nitty gritty of adjusting your grazing, but just the big picture of what it's your your perspective as a landowner that's now uh, doing your grazing with a bird in mind. Yeah. Okay, well, and I and I love this question. The, the last two questions that I heard people talking about moving cattle around and, and such, it all ties in together with this. Our family has been grazing on this 1,700 acres that we own for 30 years. And prior to that, it was grazed on in, in different fashions for about 60 years prior to that. And until about six years ago, we didn't realize, I wouldn't have known a best for sparrow if you held it in your hand and showed it to us. And then we learned that we had a, a really large number of them. And we've started to make adjustments to our grazing program to not only run cattle efficiently, but also manage for habitat for the best for sparrows. And the good news for anybody that's a, a livestock owner or managing grazing, we could tell you that we put on more pounds on the same number of cattle last year than we ever have. And that's after making some adjustments to be in the Vesper Sparrow habitat early in the season and out of it during their breeding season. And we're, we're expanding on that this year. And the people that we've worked with, like Bob Altman, have been amazing. And we continue to learn a lot about these birds and their habitat and of course, in our specific application or area, and we're enjoying it, including my grandkids. So it's been very positive. Awesome. Thank you, Derek. So, so do I just want to give folks the chance to ask a few more questions now that Derek has joined and then um, Derek, are you able to stay for the, the rest of it or do you have to pop, jump off soon? No, no, I, I am so thankful to have found this place. I may not move for a couple of days. Okay, great. Okay, um, any any questions for Derek? Um, Michelle, your hand is up, but that might be from before. So, Ann Krager, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, hi, Derek, how are you? Um, <clears throat> I had a question about your grazing rotations. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. When when we began in the cattle operations on the ranch, I I was not a cattleman, so I had a lot to learn and I still do. But the rotational grazing concept was becoming popular then. And so we started to fence the, the ranch into smaller paddocks, developing water and on all the infrastructure that it takes to be able to do that. And currently we run 14 paddocks on our 1700 acres. And when we first started, there were basically four. And we have plans this year to break those paddocks down. Some of them will be as small as 12 acres this year, and we will graze them for perhaps 12 hours and move them to another paddock. Now that has to do with some of the upland nesting sites for the Vesper Sparrows where we're doing some experimenting and 
we're going to, I'm sure Elsbeth or somebody has, or will talk about the monitoring work that we're going to do to get some information. But what we're finding, you know, the, the term prescriptive grazing is pretty popular right now and regenerative, I can never say that word, regenerative, that's not right either. That's real popular right now with Greg Judy on YouTube. And we're using a single wire to make our paddock smaller and smaller, but we have to develop the infrastructure, the water systems, and of course put some fencing up, which is pretty easy. And we're excited about this. We, we think this is giving us better feed, more feed, and helping wildlife. So it's a, it seems to be a win for everybody. And that's what we're doing right now. Perfect. So I think that's a great segue. I think we're going to jump into hearing from some of these partners that are providing um, technical and financial support because a lot of them are, you know, exactly what we're kind of talking about here. And then we'll be able to open questions to everybody. Um, so with that, I'm going to just move this forward. Tom Snyder, would you like to talk? Sure, Elspeth. So I'm Tom Snyder. Uh, let me get my camera on. I'm Tom Snyder and I'm the district conservationist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service in Eugene. Um, so the Natural Resources Conservation Service works exclusively on private land with private landowners. Um, so we NRCS has tried since the beginning of our agency in the 30s in response to the Dust Bowl to be locally led. So that means we try to solicit input from partners and members of the community and producers as to where the highest priority resource concerns are and where, how we could most effectively help treat those resource concerns. And um, so in Oregon, we have established conservation implementation strategies. So every district conservationist has been tasked with coming up with different strategies for their own local service area. And sometimes these strategies can cover multiple counties. But where these strategies begin is at our local work group meeting. So annually we have a meeting where we invite producers and partners to let them know that, hey, this is what we've been doing. These are our current strategies. Do you think that this is still working? How could we more effectively utilize these strategies? Um, and so I'm going to share with you in a little bit about um, how to find out what strategies are available in your area. But I want you to know that if you don't have a particular strategy in your area, an opportunity to bring that to somebody's attention is through the local work group process. NRCS is doing those right now. My meeting is scheduled for next week. And unfortunately, it's going to be virtual like most beings are these days, but um, hopefully it's still productive. But at these local work group meetings, it's really a uh, documenting conversations that we've been having all year long. So I work with a number of landowners producers and partners and we're always strategizing and coming up with ideas and the local work group is kind of the formal structure where we finalize a lot of those ideas. Elspeth, could you show my first slide please? So this is just the Oregon NRCS website. Um, I put the link here, but you know, don't worry about the link. It looks kind of confusing if you just type into your search engine NRCS Oregon, it'll bring you to this page right here. And in the bottom middle of the page, you can see current FY21 funding opportunities. So that's a map where you can uh, open the map, zoom into your county or your area and figure out what um, funding priorities are for those areas right now. And then also the best way to figure out what's going on is just to contact your local USDA service center and talk to the NRCS district conservationist or soil conservationist or whoever answers the phone and just get to know them and talk with them. 
We do uh, field visits all the time. There's no fee for our services. I'm happy to come out and kick the dirt with folks and bounce ideas off of one another um, and begin those conversations that I was talking about that we have all year long. Elspeth, can you go to my next slide? So when you click on that interactive map, this is what comes up and this is just a snip of what is in my area, the strategies um, that I'm utilizing. And you can see the clumpy, bunched, textured area. That is our oak, woodland, and savanna restoration funding pool. And that's kind of those mid elevation lands outside of the valley bottom. So typically the valley bottom soils are extremely high value cropland and um, the agricultural operations are pretty intense there. And uh, so there's a real production focus, but as you get into the foothill soils, they're not quite as productive from an agricultural perspective, but they're still extremely productive from a habitat and wildlife perspective. A lot of times our native species uh, can compete a lot better on some of the poorer soils. So in the valley bottom where you got deep, rich soils, you know, anything can grow there. As you get into some of the more shallow soils that are a little more droughty, um, there's just a, less of a wide range of species that can compete there. And it appears that a lot of our um, local wildlife and plant species are more adapted and can compete a little bit better in these areas. So the black hatching is our forestry funding pool where we're funding forest enhancements and then that pink blotch off to the right. That's a McKinsey funding pool focused on water quality for uh, because uh, Eugene uses the McKinsey for drinking water. EWEB is a big partner with that. So if you were to come to this, you can see these and kind of have an idea what area you fall into. Um, but I hope you would please contact me or whoever is in your local service area to find out and have some some conversations with them. So just I, I want to because it fits best. I want to talk a little bit just a couple minutes on our oak strategy. Um, so what we're focused on with our oak strategy is basically lack of disturbance and the successional change from open habitat to closed woody habitat. And in a lot of our projects in the before condition looks like an impenetrable wall of vegetation that is not useful to uh, for agricultural purposes, for grazing or for wildlife. It's just so dense. It's almost a biological desert on the soil surface just because of the thick dense canopy and in these areas a lot of times there's huge four year old 400 year old legacy oaks that are being overtopped by 40 year old fir trees so we work with private landowners to thin these areas out to roughly 50 percent canopy cover push the margins of the meadows back and this is where there's really good opportunity for grazing to be incorporated into the restoration methodology. And in part of this funding pool, we have cross fencing and water development available to folks to separate their production pastures from areas where they wanna focus on habitat produ production. So one example is our native grasses. The growth point on the native grasses is higher than the introduced pasture species. So pasture grasses, we say you can graze down to three inch height minimum. Our native grasses, we encourage a six inch minimum, and that's just because the growth point on those native grasses are a little bit higher. And I'm working with grazers to go through and graze early in the season, March, April on the upland sites. A lot of times you can get some late winter, extremely early spring grazing and then send them through again after the flowers have bloomed and emerged in July and August. And the idea is to knock down the grass height to allow more room for the forbs to come up, creating more species diversity in the plant community, but also attracting insects that are looking to those flowering plants for nectar resources. 
um, and managing the grass height because if you think about a four foot tall standard grass can smother out all of the 12 inch and shorter wildflowers that you would typically see in there so using livestock as a management tool in those areas adjacent to the production pastures because as we've heard before it's tricky to find grazers willing to move their livestock into an area and the first question you're going to be asked well is the area fenced and do you have water and who's going to pay for that so being a little bit opportunistic and work working with folks who are interested in both livestock and habitat which are actually pretty common in my experience working around Eugene and I spent a lot of time in Benton County and there's a lot of folks really interested in both their agricultural operations but how can they tailor those operations to benefit wildlife um, any way they can and that that's Elspeth that's what I have that I brought to present and I'm willing to entertain questions either now or later perfect and yeah, yeah, Matt, Leslie yeah. Smith added how important NRCS was to, you know, fencing pastures and bringing water infrastructure to Bald Hill Farm. Um, so just a really great um, partner to have for this um, implementing this type of grazing. Uh, I think I'm going to we'll let Jared talk and Laura and then we'll have questions for everyone unless anyone has a very specific question for Tom they want to get out of the way. Seeing none, I'm going to uh, give the floor to Jared. Hey, everybody. Elspeth, thanks for having me. I'm Jared Jabusik with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I work the. Don't shoot me. I work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at. Uh, Finley Refuge is where my office is if I went to my office anymore, but I really don't. So I work in the partners program, which is exclusively off refuge, working with landowners doing voluntary habitat restoration. I do some technical assistance. Uh, we can provide some material assistance uh, when resources allow, allow and uh, and we can be helpful to usually a larger project because I don't have lots of resources at my disposal. And we're not a grant program. Um, it's more of a uh, uh, in-kind assistance when we go out and work on stuff. I'm glad Tom got to go first because he uh, is much more of an expert in this kind of stuff. So. I'm just going to go big picture a little bit and try not to take too long, but uh, prairie and oak habitats are early to mid serial stage habitats, which mean they need regular a regular disturbance regime and without that grassland savannas oak woodlands. It's all going to turn into uh, dense shrubs and woodlands. So yay for Tohees. Bob, how are Tohees doing? They're doing fine. Okay, that's what I thought. So how do we disturb the, the land now? Burning was the historic tactic. It's really hard to do these days. Even in a good year, we don't get all the burning done that we would like to do in the last couple of years we've completely struck out either because of lack of resources like we had this year because everybody was out fighting wildfires still or last year when we got a bunch of rain in september and by the thing, time things dried out everything had greened up so that's just really hard to do on a big enough scale to to make a lot of difference to bird populations so then there's mechanical work like mowing um, that's expensive. It's hard to do on slopes. Working around rocks and downed wood is difficult. Uh, and so that's pretty tough. Chemicals are probably the most widely used right now, at least to keep woody vegetation from uh, re-sprouting. Uh, they cost a little bit less and it's safer than mowing and the effects last longer. 
so there's that option and then there's grazing and non-native grasses are generally the biggest issue for prairies as well as the vesper sparrows uh, it generally gets tall and thick. It takes away bare ground uh, from birds and suppresses wildflowers at the same time. <clears throat> it's hard to achieve this in conservation areas uh, and restoration areas as far as dealing with the, the grasses and the grass height. Uh, the refuges have quite a bit of this habitat at, at Basket Slough and Finley that uh, the Vesper Sparrows ought to like, and we just don't have them. And we're able to burn them on regular intervals, and we still don't have the birds. So uh, that's why, you know, these grazing lands are really important. Cattle in particular, it seems like they target grasses uh, or maybe are a little bit more indiscriminate than some other livestock. So they can also be used during the growing season, whereas we can't burn that time of year. Uh, the best prairie plant communities I've seen anywhere is uh, uh, grazing early and grazing late, like uh, like Tom was saying, uh, manage the grass height and then after the plant sets seed, those hooves just grind the seed into the, the ground. Uh, it's, it's really great. Um, also, any of this kind of work helps with fire resiliency, having a more widely spaced oaks with the herbaceous understory is gonna save a lot of those oaks. Whereas if you have a dense woodland, if fire gets going in there, it's gonna kill everything. Um, so from my perspective, everything I've seen, which is not as much as Tom has seen, uh, grazing objectives and oak and prairie habitat objectives on conservation lands have way more in common than they don't have. Um, and then uh, ranching at a, a landscape level is that it, the problem is it's a disappearing way of life. Um, ranching, like Matt said, doesn't appear to be a get rich scheme. Uh, it might be possible to make some tweaks to grazing plans here and there, but like Matt said, the animals have to gain weight and the these tweaks to grazing plans are not gonna it does not help to write anything out years ahead of time. The, those decisions got to be made, uh, you know, the week before or something like that. So as Matt said, a lot of uh, flexibility is key. Animal husbandry is uh, just a lot of work, a lot of logistics and infrastructure to take care of. So. Uh, when the biggest risk to a property is when lands change, change hands, uh, somebody else comes in, it's just a heck of a lot easier to plant fir trees and uh, let it go or lease it out to somebody who's probably gonna plant vines or maybe Christmas trees or something like that. Um, so anymore, we just have very few opportunities to use grazing as a tool. So we need to take advantage of it where we can because it's not going to be everywhere. And uh, I, I really think on the landscape level, we need to support that way of life, try to keep um, as much grazing land grazing as possible, um, particularly when changing hands, especially to the next generation, making sure it pays for them uh, and is, is a viable uh, option uh, for land use in the future. So that's kind of my, my soapbox take on the whole thing. So sorry if I went over time. That was, that was great. <laughs>
Um, thanks so much, Jared. So I think we'll um, let Laura talk a little bit about the WWMP, which is how we were able to protect Crestville Oaks with a CE, how Bald Hill Farm partially was helped um, acquire that into conservation status, and then we'll open it to questions for everyone. Thanks. I um, appreciate it. Um, I'm the only person other than Tom who did a good thing and brought slides. I should have just shown the the ODF and W badge and yarned on like Jared. Um, so I just want to say, first of all, I'm really happy that Jared and Tom got to go before me because um, our program, the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program, um, really depends on people like Jared and Tom and the programs that they have to uh, interconnect and work with the properties that uh, the program helps our partners and our agency acquire because those properties eventually need restoration. So we were really grateful for those programs. So can't really thank those people enough. But anyway, I'm Laura Tesler. Um, I am the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program Coordinator. Um, I kind of feel like I'm getting dusty in this program. Um, I was here when this program was being negotiated in 2010. Um, I was hiding under the table when they were kind of going back and forth when um, Governor Kulongowski was negotiating the program. Um, so I saw the, I guess I saw the baby being born and now I get to see the adolescent. So I'll probably be here till the end of the program after 2025, um, because of course I only have six years to go now before I can retire. So I don't know, maybe we'll see. Um, we've had the great, great fortune um, to help with Bald Hill, the acquisition of Bald Hill, and also with the acquisition of the conservation easement on Cresswell, um, and work with uh, Derek Salyers and his family. And I have to say that one of the greatest moments in the field that I had was being out on um, that property in the very beginning with Derek and seeing these little black and white sparrow-like birds hopping around and going, gee, I think those might be Vesper sparrows with my super limited knowledge of birds because I'm a fishery biologist. And then Bob um, getting very excited about that later. So that was pretty great seeing those Vesper sparrows. But the greatest part was, is that we saw them in areas that were being actively grazed and that's where we saw them. And we have also seen Vesper sparrows in other areas where there's a Christmas tree um, plantation pretty much right next door to a property. So, you know, these areas um, that Bob touched on earlier that are in private, you know, land ownership, it's just really critical for this program um, to work together with our partners to help acquire some of these properties and set them aside in a permanent um, nature. And so that's what we're doing through the, the uh, WWMP. And we signed an agreement in 2010 with Bonneville Power Administration. Um, and basically, we said that if you give us 100, roughly $147 million, um, we will purchase 16,880 acres of wildlife habitat by 2025. And we're almost there. Um, we're just slightly past 11,000 acres at this point. And we do purchase um, this habitat in two ways, through fee title acquisitions and through conservation easements. Unfortunately, we do not work directly with landowners. Like some programs, they will treat directly with the landowner. Um, we do have to work through a third party, like a quasi-governmental, like a soil and water district, or uh, we work through land trusts, or we work through other 501c3s. Um, we also work through um, other government agencies. And we also have bought some of this property uh, for ODF and W themselves. Um, basically, the way that uh, these properties are acquired is they're acquired because they have conservation opportunity areas. Uh, we have certain areas in the Willamette Valley. And this program is only in the Willamette Valley. 
So I do get a lot of phone calls from people um, who live on the Sandy River. And, you know, unfortunately, we can't help those folks because they drain into the Columbia. But um, this program is based on conservation opportunity areas, which is set up through uh, the Oregon Conservation Strategy. And you can get on the website. Um, you could just Google Oregon Conservation Strategy and you can look at all these conservation areas that are throughout the Willamette Valley alley and see where they're located. And that's one of the um, areas and the ways that these properties are solicited in private. And these, we support Oregon Conservation Strategy and ESA listed species. And can I have the next slide, please? So these are some of our strategies that we use um, during our process. And we do have a solicitation that opens um, we opened it in February this year and we'll close it in April and we open our solicitation once a year. And basically we open the solicitation for people to put in applications um, for properties that they would like to put through our process. And then when the solicitation closes, uh, all the applications are compiled and they go through a um, two layer review process. And the, we have a technical review team and a wildlife advisory group. And they consider some of these um, aspects that you see on the slide before you. And they look at things, you know, like the high quality habitat. They look at um, different connectivity issues, uh, you know, such as do these properties provide ways that wildlife can move back and forth. Um, we have certain areas, for example, on the North Sandy Am, we have a sponsor who's done a pretty good um, job of buying quite a bit of riparian area along the North Sandy Am River where there has basically been a corridor acquired um, permanently that goes stretches from Mahama to Staten and kind of working to you know build that corridor out and stretch it out over time and uh, also if I forgot to mention we only do permanent um, fee title acquisitions and conservation easements um, we don't do temporaries um, <clears throat> we also look at degree of cost share, although cost share is not required in our program, that is something that is, you know, looked upon favorably. Um, the amount of partnerships that people bring in through these applications. Um, we do consider public access, although that is really, um, it's something that's considered an asterisk. Um, we do like for our properties uh, that we acquire in the WWMP portfolio to provide some um, type of public access, but we do realize that usually when you're working on conservation easements, um, you, you know, people that own conservation easements, they usually still are living on the property and they're not really keen on having a lot of public access on their private property. So we do realize that there are extenuating circumstances. And also we do have wildlife that, you know, need privacy and, you know, have some type of populations where, you know, having public access would be detrimental to that. Uh, we do buy properties that we call dual prop purpose, which do provide aquatic habitat and a lot of wildlife um, habitat as well. So they provide, you know, double crediting for that. And we try to keep our selection criteria to be somewhat adaptive and make them as flexible as possible uh, throughout the years. We just passed year 10, so we have five more years of the program. So we're trying to kind of keep that as flexible as possible as we move through time. Can you have the next slide, please, Elspeth? So here we are, 10 years. Um, our overall obligation was 26,537, but we had already purchased almost 10,000 acres uh, before 2010. So those 10,000 acres were sort of folded in um, at the time of the agreement. And so those were the 23 legacy properties is what we call them. And we um, had, you know, those were partners that uh, had worked with the program before there was an agreement. And like I said, there was almost 10,000 acres that were uh, bought before then. And those properties were scattered up and down the valley. Um, one of our partners, uh, Greenbelt Land Trust, has was very instrumental in the early days of the program. Of course, McKenzie River Trust was another big partner at those times. Um, and since then, we've moved forward with 47 other properties. And as you can see, we have 36 fee title agreements and 11 conservation easements. 
So really moving along, I have an average $5,412 an acre and spent $63 million so far. So I think, you know, in retrospect, um, as far as, you know, for birds, for grassland birds in particular, I think this, the Willamette program is really critical. And in the next couple of years, there's some very exciting um, conservation easements and fee title properties that are kind of queuing up, um, being prepared to be into the program. And, you know, fingers crossed that they do come in. Um, both, there's a couple of properties in particular that are pretty exciting for grassland birds and for butterfly um, that I think are are really almost comforting to think of them being in permanent protection. Um, I look at how the valley has changed in the last 20 years, and I think about how the valley will change in the next 5, 10, 20, 50 years. And I think that basically we're looking at a large urban spread from Portland all the way down to Eugene. And so... In 20 years, I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at the valley. And I think that it's entirely, you know, realistic that the only property, big pieces of property that are going to be preserved outside of obviously state parks and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to be these properties that were purchased by the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program. And I think that's integral to the survival of some of these species, especially Vesper, street torn lark, um, you know, Fender's blue butterfly, many of these other species that depend on that kind of habitat. Because I think in 20 years, if it's not preserved, there's gonna be a house sitting on it, or it's gonna be in hazelnut production, or, you know, fill in the blank. So, and then more likely a house is gonna be sitting on it because that's how the valley is going with population pressure. Um, and as far as grazing concern, I do have some agricultural experience in my closet. Um, I used to work for NRCS in the beginning of my career. And although I worked mostly on the east side and worked with grazers on the east side, it is a disappearing way of life. And when I came and work on the west side, I worked down um, in Coquille area and I worked with dairy farmers and I did have some experience working with the Tillamook dairy farmers as well. Um, they are also doing grazing, but they're doing a much more intensive um, style of grazing where it's very regimented, very controlled. Um, you know, they've got their, you know, they've, they've got everything computerized where they're moving thing, you know, cattle, you know, exactly from one pasture to another. And on the east side, it's it's very regimented, very controlled. Um, people are very in tune with, you know, how they're moving cattle and those, you know, very, I know exactly where my cattle are and what they're doing. And we do want to keep those working farms in business and we do want to keep the dairy farmers in business and we do want to keep those people in business. But I think a lot of people that are now doing this this style in the valley are kind of doing it because it's kind of fashionable or you know they like the idea the charm of having a cattle ranch but they're not really sure how to do it so it's really important that we bring in people like um, NRCS and people like Jer you know Jared's Partners Program to work with these folks and make sure that we're helping them figure it out and you know do it in a way that it works for them and it works for the birds too. So, and if you have any other questions about the program, let me know. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. So, um. Just looking at the time, we're going to try to move on to Q&A and, and we'll just answer as many questions as we can while folks have the time. Um, but before we jump to that, I just want to highlight that um, this, yeah, this is part one of a two part series and the next one will be in May. Hopefully we'll be able to be out in the field, but at the very least, we'll have someone out with a camera following Derek around in the field talking about uh kind of the the real the implementation the the details about timing and duration and all of the little things that come into you know adjusting your grazing regime for 
conservation for grassland birds. Um, so with all of that, I, um, I'm going to look at the chat. There's a few questions here. Um, the first one is from Adrian, can the Vesper Sparrow be considered a keystone species if a landowner, you know, is providing suitable habitat for it um, through their grazing regime adjustments? Um, can one assume that there'd be other, um, you know, rare species that would have benefits? And if so, kind of who does benefit? Uh, I'll take that, I guess. Um, that's a good question. And I kind of would refer back to if those graphs that I had early on that showed the seven species and how they sorted themselves out across different uh, gra uh, different gradients of habitat conditions or habitat features. And there's a lot of overlap between all of those species and all of those conditions, and there's areas of non-overlap. Could, could you consider a keystone species? I mean, I guess you could. Uh, I tend to not, I mean, when I think of a keystone species, I might think of something a little broader in its habitat requirements. Uh, I typically look at savanna sparrow when I think of grasslands, and I'm not trying to address high priority species necessarily specifically. I tend to think more of savanna sparrow um, because of the breadth of its coverage of conditions that it will tolerate. Um, but, you know, that's debatable. I, 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 I can understand that someone might want to think that. The one thing I will point out, though, that there is a great connectivity between Oregon Vesper Sparrow and Fender's Blue Butterfly because of Kincaid's Lupin. Kincaid's Lupin in the valley is, um, well, actually any Lupin, but certainly Kincaid's Lupin, if you have it, um, is a frequently um, sort of the host plant for nests for Vesper Sparrows. So I think there's a pretty good connection there between those two um, high priority even listed species. Great. Uh, Fred, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Hey, say, um, wonderful seminar. And uh, as a way to champion browsing as a management tool, like, do we have estimates of like the historical pre-European contribution that browsing made to, um, you know, the reduction in the biomass from these prairie sites? Because um, I know that, you know, when Douglas and Menzies came through, they made a lot of interesting observations of the large, you know, the high densities of of deer and elk, uh, like the and like the Caleb Pool and circle burns and the herding and concentrating of these animals. Same thing on Woodby Island with the uh, corral hunting and um, we have some of these. Um, you know, like, you know, given the challenge of maintaining these small family dairy farms and that we have these high densities of elk and deer, and particularly elk like up on the Swim Prairie. Um, well, I know they're often considered a nuisance, but I was just curious, do any of these native co-evolved browsers fit into this browsing uh, equation where they've been ranched or hunted to the betterment of grasslands and associated birds? Over. I'm not sure. If, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and I'm not sure. I, I cannot. Um, I don't know that that information has been, uh, or, or there's been some kind of attempt to develop that uh, information and coalesce it and try to do some comparisons with the historic great um, grazers and the current grazers. I, you know, maybe someone has that's just not kind of outside of my area of expertise. Um, but certainly, certainly, I think um, Gary pointed out in one of his slides that 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 Native ungulates were a, a factor in um, managing the conditions that we think of now for Vesper Sparrow in terms of grass height, grass, de you know, density of their herbaceous later, the amount of bare ground, those kind of things. They certainly played a role. And of course, there are fewer of them now. So that's probably one of the factors that has gone into the conditions that we see now that, that challenge us. The conditions now that challenge us, which are that the herbaceous vegetation, mostly grasses, grows taller and denser. Part of that is due to loss of ungulate grazing, but there are certainly other reasons too. I mean, now we have all these non-native invasive 
grasses in particular, annual grasses in particular, they're just aggressive, grow tall and dance and out compete. And so, you know, that's certainly a factor too. So I, there's a bunch of factors, but I, I don't know if anything's been tried, anyone's tried to quantify that. Yeah, thanks, copy that. Just to, Tom, add, Tom on, might know. Just to add on to what Bob says. So I, I don't know of any speci specific studies quantifying that amount, but we do take into consideration when we're establishing, you know, stocking rates and how much forage is available, what the uh, wildlife pressure is on those pastures. From a restoration standpoint, the native ungulates are great to have on the property and they certainly are an important species, but you really can't control them the way you can uh, cows or sheep or whatever your grazing animal is. So while we do take it into consideration, we don't count on that as a disturbance that would meet our management goals out there. Uh, follow up question that was asked is how do elk and deer grazing patterns differ from cattle grazing? Can you speak to that, Tom? Sure. So we, uh, Matt talked a little bit about cow grazing and thinking about animals and the way their mouths, their shape and what they eat. So a cow, they don't use their lips to pull stuff into their mouth. They stick their tongue out and grab a clump of grass and pull it into their mouth. So a cow will take, um, you know, the roughly the same amount across the whole pasture. They are somewhat selective, but they're not going to be selective on the individual plant basis and then you get into sheep and goats and their mouths are much more nimble than a cow and their teeth i mean they can select individual plants using their lips and then their teeth they can nibble that plant right to the ground and a cow um, is more looking at grass forage whereas um sheep and especially go to more browsers, they're gonna go after woody species. So if you've got a bunch of blackberries or something like that, goats would be more effective than cows. Sheep are somewhat in the middle. They will graze grass and they will browse, um, but cows and goats are kind of the opposite ends of that spectrum with sheep being in the middle. Due to the selectivity of the grazing habits, I can't point to a study that say it says this, but in my mind, it just makes sense that cows would be much less selective. And if you're trying to graze for overall species diversity, um, timing that grazing using a less selective grazing animal seems like it would, would be more effective. Great. Adrian, did you have an, uh, another question? Yeah, I have a question for Great. another question for Bob. Um, Bob, you mentioned that the five nests in the four years were directly impacted by cattle. Um, can you comment on the, the stocking rate where you reported that figure and does that represent an average stock rate uh, for the valley? No, I cannot because the, the sites that I'm working on, well, the, the three sites that I'm working on now their grazing regimes are based on what they are, uh, what they've decided um, is appropriate for them. It's not a, it, it, it's not, uh, for the most part, it's not a cooperative effort in terms of trying to work for Oregon Vesper Sparrows. Now, the Bald Hill Farm is the one that's different from that. Um, but for the most part, we are not tracking stocking rates. Um, uh, duration, intensity, those kinds of things. We're not tracking that with the animals. We're, our end of things is mostly tracking it through the vegetation sampling and looking at the conditions that are most desirable. And then the goal is, and that's what we're working with Derek on here in the near future, is to take the information that we've gained and then go to the rancher with that information and say, okay, how can we work together to achieve these kind of conditions that we we're pretty confident the birds need? Um, and, and then it's basically a give and take back and forth in terms of, you know, stocking rates, duration, intensity, all those kind of things. But no, we're, it's not a research study where we are uh, 
uh, it's not a control um, where we have uh, the ability to manage those kinds of things. We're, we're, do we're doing this opportunistically on properties that are uh, allowing us access to study this bird, but we're not, you know, working together to try to, um, other than Bald Hill Farm, to try to um, um, come up with some particular stocking rate or duration of grazing, that kind of thing. All right, thank you. Um, Laura, there's a question for you. What tools or systems do you use to value degraded habitats? And is there anything replicable for other agencies to use? This question is for me. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the general question is, you know, when uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas, but uh, kind of when looking at potential projects to be protected to get this funding, how do you kind of evaluate who, what's degraded, what it, what's its opportunity? I think, you know, as someone who went through the process, our experience was it was having Jared and Tom and Bob out on the site, other yeah. uh, other local ecologists that were giving their personal expertise you know, right. their, their professional experience saying here's the status and here's kind of what's needed here's the kind of opportunity level that exists here right so i think it i think that's a good that's actually a good question um the program doesn't pay for restoration so all the program pays for if you bring a property to our program all the program pays for is acquisition so I think that that is a good question because, you know, one of the things that the, the project is going to be evaluated on is how much restoration does it need. So, you know, if you're going to bring a program forward and or a project forward and as a proponent, you, you know, you, you would say, yeah, uh, you know, if you're, uh, for example, if the site is fairly degraded, you want to definitely have a plan as to okay i'm gonna um, restore this site and this is how i'm going to do it and i have all these partnerships lined up i've already talked to jared and jared's gonna have a million dollars worth of partners funding or you know or some other scenario like that um and and my organization has the capability to restore the property for Vesper Sparrow and, you know, give them the habitat that they may need or other grassland birds. So I, I think I think the answer is we take pretty much all comers, but you pretty much want to make sure that when you're bringing your a property forward that you already have a plan sort of sketched out as to how you're going to restore it and how you're going to bring the property up to desired future condition for the species that you're bringing the property in for. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a great answer, Laura. And I think certainly in the case of Cresswell Oaks, that was one of the reasons why we were so excited to find Derek and his family on this big property that was already in pretty good shape because of the way they'd managed it and knowing that with a conservation easement, they'd stay on the land, they'd continue to do that management with a little more input um, so that we can kind of gear it towards various species like the Oregon Vesper Sparrow. We knew that there wouldn't be a huge amount of input needed because that grazing is occurring and, and um, all the other great things Derek and, and, and RCS and U.S. Fish Partners are doing, you know, in the Oak Woodlands. Um, Tom, did you want to add to that? I mean, I know you came out and did pasture scores at Cresswell and um, we certainly use those. So it, it it depends on the habitat type, but I know in our oak, um, Nathan Adelman, colleague out of the Tangent office, put together a tool that we use. But basically, we're looking at our legacy oaks present. What's their level of encroachment? What is the percent native versus invasive? But I think one of the biggest factors has got to be landowner capacity. Does this individual property or landowner have the capacity to implement the necessary conservation projects. Not everybody has the capacity that Derek and his family does to do this type of work. And I've been on several great properties where, yeah, there's huge potential there, but who's going to do the work and who's going to maintain a disturbance dependent climax plant community? 
And I've spent more people talk more time talking people out of it, getting them to understand what they're getting themselves into when you want to have perpetual management on something that's disturbance dependent. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I just I wanted to just say something real fast about conservation easements. You know, conservation easements are all about the landowner in so many ways because the landowner is still involved in the picture in a conservation easement. And, you know, having the right landowner involved is magic with a conservation easement is it's the greatest partnership you can ever have and so when you're working with with conservation easements landowners who have succession plans who have you know who have their eyes on the prize are are just the people that you want to work with that you want to get in this program that you want to really get get the good stuff going with um because conservation easements are hard. They're not for the faint of heart. And you really just have to have that three-legged stool all put together. I mean, fee title easements are, e fee title acquisitions are easy. I mean, they're cut and dried. You walk away, the property is somebody else's. But yeah, conservation easements, but they're so vital to so many of these properties that we yeah. need for conservation. Couldn't, couldn't agree more, Laura. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you spoke out about that. So I'm looking at the time. It's three o'clock. I want to thank everyone for participating in this, for all the great questions, uh, for sticking with this. I hope you learned a lot. Um, I hope we got you interested and excited about grazing for grassland birds, and I hope that you'll, you'll come to the next event in May. We'll um, send out the recording of this and any materials from the partners. Um, following this uh and then we'll also send out all the details for the may event um so with that i'll let everyone be but um i don't know if any of the presenters can hang around if there are a few questions but i i kind of get the sense that we had gotten to all the questions so um folks can certainly follow up with you later um so just a big thank you to everyone for participating thank you Elspeth. thanks Thanks, Elspeth. Thanks, Elspeth. Thanks for putting this together. Thank you, guys. Thanks. I'm not Elspeth. seeing any other questions pop up, so you guys might be off the hook. Let me double check. <laughs> Thank you, Elspeth. So glad you could make it, Derek. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> It's Derek Sellers. I miss you, Derek Sellers. When are you going to come see us? Uh, I don't know. She has donuts at the May thing. I might come down. <laughs> I mean, you know me. I never, I'm, I have to come down there. You know, I didn't.